Good time of the day, everyone. Whenever you are, by the way, please drop your city and country into the chat so we know which communities we are serving. Uh, again, welcome to Los Angeles Data Platform User Group. Thank you for joining us. My name is Steve, and I'll be host and moderator of this virtual meeting. Uh, I'll be joined by, looks like, Yelena, uh, and she's going to manage uh, the raffle. Uh, as you can see, we are available on Eventbrite Meetup. Uh, so you can uh, check our schedule or future meetings or past meetings uh, through uh, Eventbrite or Meetup. Uh, let's go to the next one. And of course, we are available in most on most social media platforms. Uh, is it Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram? Not much Pinterest with some YouTube and Rumble of all the recorded sessions. And from time to time, we are sharing session materials through our own GitHub. Uh, so if you're attending for the first time, you would like to follow us. Here's a full footprint of our social media. Uh, please feel free to join our mailing list to receive weekly newsletters as well as event notifications. And you can just scan this QR code. It will take you to the mailing list. And this event is sponsored by Data Integrity Technologies. Uh, it's a nonprofit that manages uh, the user group, which is LA Data Platform, as well as SQL Saturday in Los Angeles. We also have two sponsors from our SQL Saturday in LA event, which is which are Microsoft and SolarWinds. And whoever is not familiar with SolarWinds, uh, they are owning Sentry One. So most people are aware of Sentry One or essentially SQL Sentry product, which is a monitoring product. Uh, at the end of this meeting, we'll raffle a custom T-shirt. Uh, you can scan the QR code and it will take you to the link to uh, provide the information and we'll take that information and we'll raffle the T-shirt from that. And during this presentation, feel free. Uh, one more time. During this presentation, please feel free to drop questions in chat or alternatively unmute yourself and ask questions. And without further ado, let's move to the rock star of today's online meeting. Ken, please take it away and introduce yourself, please. I don't, I don't know about rock star, but. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm Ken Fisher and y'all are going to watch me deal with some security headaches. A uh, little bit about myself. I've been honored to be a Microsoft MVP for the last six years, which I still think is pretty cool. Um, I've been blogging at SQLstudies.com for the last 10 or so years, a little over. Um, you can email me at SQLstudent144 at gmail.com, although I'm not terribly good at responding to emails, so that's kind of going to be hit or miss. Believe it or not, your best bet to get a hold of me is still going to be Twitter. I will probably be going down with the ship. Um, and I am at SQL Student 144 on Twitter. Ken, Spe can you share can you share your screen? Oh, I'm not sharing my screen yet. Not a problem. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. There we go. So speaking of Twitter, um, I was actually asked twice today, so I'll mention it here. On Twitter, um, my name is spelled F-I-S-Q-H-E-R, and in parentheses it says the Q is silent. In case you're interested, um, there are two common ways to spell Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R, which is what you would kind of expect, and then one where you have F-I-S-C-H-E-R, where the C is silent. Um, I was just in a mood one day and decided, OK, if they can have a C in their name that doesn't do anything, I'm going to put a Q in my name. I was only going to leave it for a little while when I realized, you know, I went to a, a conference and someone said, oh, you're the guy with the Q in his name and decided I would keep it. So go figure. Um, this session is it's going to be a practical demonstration. Um, my previous job, I worked for about 15 years and it was a very big company with a lot of churn. And by churn, I mean 
they were constantly having people leave and new people coming in, constantly moving people from one division to another, to, from one project to another. Um, we would be getting new instances from outside the company, from different divisions within the company. It was just constant movement, which of course means that security is constantly having to be updated. There are mistakes, there are problems. It, it just, it was never ending. And I got pretty good at dealing with some of it. So I thought I would do a practical demonstration on how I dealt with some of the stuff. All right, so that said, I want to set a couple expectations. I am not covering encryption. Um, encryption is not just a subject on its own. It is multiple subjects on its own. Um, there are uh, multiple sessions to cover very simple parts of encryption. Um, it's, it's outside the scope of what I want to cover today. Um, I am not going to cover what permissions are needed for any given task. Uh, that link there, um, and I will be sharing my, my slide deck and everything um, probably sometime tomorrow. Um, and I believe Steve is going to share a link to where I've got it. But that particular link there will take you to the permissions page in Microsoft's no longer called Books Online, and I have no idea what they're calling it these days. Um, but in there, there is a poster that they provide that has a list of all the permissions available within Microsoft, or with sorry, within SQL Server, within the data plat data engine itself, which comes to the fact that I am not covering SSIS, SSRS, SSAS. I am covering the data engine. I am using the management studio. Um, the majority of what I'm doing will work through um, Azure Data Studio because it's mostly going to be code. Uh, I, I mean, you could use whatever you want, honestly. Um, I'm not covering the cloud. This is going to be on premises. That said, a lot of what I'm doing will work depending on where you are in the cloud. Uh, part of why I'm not covering the cloud is because a managed instance is dramatically different from AWS RDS. And what works in one place may not work in another. My goal is to give you an idea of, of some tools that you can use and to share a tool that I've written. Um, I'm not covering Active Directory specifically. Uh, I will be talking about Active Directory logins, Active Directory users, groups, that kind of thing. But I'm not going to actually go into the Active Directory tools. I'm not going to show you how to do anything in there. Although I do recommend if you're interested in security and, and you plan on doing anything in SQL Server security, learning at least how to navigate Active Directory users and computers, because there's a lot of great information in there and it can be very useful at times. So all of that said, what am I covering? Uh, things like how do I copy logins from one instance to another? Uh, how do I copy users from one database to another? How do I script out all the permissions for a database? What permissions do I have? What permissions do you have? How did you get them? What AD groups are you using to get these permissions? How do I copy a specific person's permissions? How do I, I know what permissions they've got? That type of thing. Okay. Like I said, just practical day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, some of the tools that we'll be using. SRV permissions and DB permissions are a pair of store procedures that I've written. Um, primarily, they were meant as research tools originally. They have kind of expanded in purpose since then. Um, I find them very handy and, and you'll see why shortly. Uh, login token and user token are system views that expose the tokens that each, per each principal has. Um, that will include things like all the AD groups that you belong to, um, all of the instance level roles and database level roles that you belong to, that kind of thing. XP login information, login info is the a store procedure, an extended store procedure you can use to view Active Directory information. I don't use it very often. Um, I, I find it kind of hit and miss. When it works, it's fantastic. 
when it doesn't work, it's usually because of some obnoxious security problem, and I've had a hard time getting it to work sometimes. Um, sys.fnmy permissions is a table valued function which will list off all of your permissions to any given object. Execute as with impersonation, and we're going to use that to get a different viewpoint using some of the above tools. And then I've got a couple of scripts I'm going to show you as well. Now, the first headache, can I have sysadmin access? Now, in reality, this is any access that someone might want. Um, let's say someone wants read access to a table. Someone wants uh, write access to another table, whatever. It doesn't matter. The question that you should be asking is, why do you need to be able to do that? Um, so if someone says, I have to have sysadmin, what do you need to be able to do that actually requires sysadmin access? And believe it or not, there are a few things that do require sysadmin access, and I have had to give it out to certain service accounts. Uh, for example, um, replication. If, if you deal with a program that manipulates replication, that has to have sysadmin. The internal Microsoft store procedures and functions, in at least a few cases, actually go in and check to see if you are a member of the sysadmin role before they'll let you do anything. And now the rest of the demo, which will be the rest of the, uh, the session. OK, so starting with. Probably the most common thing that I got. Which was I can't log in. I'm getting an error. Login failed for user whatever. OK, so I'm going to try and log in as the flying monkey. And I'm going to get this error, which is login failed for user flying monkey. And that is, I'm sure you can tell, less than helpful. So what we can do is over here, I have a query that will dump the error log um, into a temp table. Now, error log. I am sure you all have all seen the error logs, data SQL Server logs. I've got seven files here. Um, at my previous company, every day we switched files and we kept 30 files. Some of them got really, really big because there's a lot going on. My, the, and so this would take a little while to run. On my machine, not much is going on, so it won't take long. This um, variable right here will tell you how many files to load. OK, and then we come down here and it loads it all into this log info table, temp table. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to run it just so you can see what the output looks like. And I'm hoping this is relatively clear and, and large enough for everybody to see. Perfect. OK, Perfect. so you can see like if I go all the way to the bottom here, I've got it in reverse order because I want to see the most recent stuff, but you can see right here where it started, you know, the startup was and where it started new file. And then all the messages that went through over however much time. Um, in this particular case, though, I want to look for any case where error text has the keyword flying monkeys. And one of the reasons I load this into a temp table is because I can constantly be changing my query and go back and run it again without having to load the files. And in this particular case, the reason that you can't log in as flying monkeys is because there's no login that matches that name. All right, so let's try Scarecrow. We're going to try Scarecrow and Scarecrow. It has a very simple password there. All right, got a login failed. 
I'm a typical user, so I'm just going to keep hitting connect because I know I got it right. I'm sure I got it right. Of course, I typed it correctly. You know, that's how this works. All right, I'm going to try one more time. Okay, this time I actually did type it correctly. All right, so let's go take a look and see what was happening there. Let's grab Scarecrow. And we'll put that right here. Run this. And in fact, the reason that it's been failing, and I, if y'all haven't dealt with this before, um, sometimes someone will put in the wrong password in um, like a, a config file. And so you might have a thousand entries saying password did not match. And that's why I like this temp table like way of doing this. And and be to be fair, this was not entirely my idea. Um, I took this from um, somebody's question on Ask SQL Server Central, and then I added to it and modified it. And so, um, but in this case, password didn't match for a while, and now it's locked out. Okay, so we need to unlock it. Let's. Uh, there are two options for unlocking. Okay, first things first, we're going to go into the GUI. Um, I'm not a huge GUI person, but I always try and show people how to do things in the GUI first. Here's the scarecrow. And you can see under status, it is in fact locked out. So let's uncheck locked out. We'll hit OK. And we're going to be told that we have to reset the password. So you cannot unlock this without resetting the password which we can't do because we don't know the password. And if we change it to something else, we could be breaking other stuff. There could be 10 different applications using this ID. Let's hope not, but there could be. Um, and nine of them have the correct password and one of them's failing. And if we change the password, we now have nine failing and one working. So let's not do that. So in fact, the way to do it, and this is, I don't understand why, but if you uncheck enforce password policy and you hit OK, and then we come back, and you will notice it is no longer locked out and we didn't have to change the password. Now that we're back, we recheck enforce password policy, uncheck expiration because it automatically gets checked, hit OK, and we're good. Now, if you're like me and you don't want to have to go into the GUI, because you might have a thousand logins here. And so it could be kind of a pain to get to where you want to be. This piece of code right here, and again, I'll be sharing all this, will unlock it. So it's going to check. You put the, the, uh, the ID here, Scarecrow. We'll check to see if it's locked. And then it turns the password policy off and back on again. Simple enough. OK. So we're going to do one more ID here. And in this case, I made the password really simple. It's just the pass, you know, the ID name. Now, here's one of the, the more interesting things that I get or that I've learned over time. If a user gets this error, they're going to come to you and they're going to say the login failed because login failed for user MySQL ID. That's what I saw. And, and what's going on? I like to get the exact message, either by hitting copy message here or by getting a screenshot of the actual error message, mostly because of this piece. Oh, hold on, let's just zoom in here a little bit. Right here. Cannot open user default database. OK, so if you get that, if you actually get the error message, a lot of times it will tell you exactly what's wrong. Um, but a lot of times people don't think to do that. But let's say they didn't, and so now we got to figure out what's going on. So I'm going to come over here. I, even that, that's only so useful. We'll put that in here because we want all error text where it's like my SQL ID. And the actual errors, interestingly enough, this particular one, it succeeds and then it fails. I don't know why. Um, and the reason it fails is because it failed to open the database wrong DB specified in the login properties. 
So if we come over here and we go to my SQL ID. Now here's where this gets even more interesting. You'll see the default database right here is empty. Okay. And that's because it doesn't have anywhere to, to look it up. So the only place to look it up is in sys.server principles right here. And we can check for my name is SQL ID. And you'll notice the default database name is wrongdb. Uh, the easy way to fix this is either um, the default database may you know, be offline. It may be uh, in recovery. There, you know, basically, it's not an active database. And from there, you need to discuss with the user, do I need to change this to master? Do I need to change it to something else? Or do you just need to wait until the restore is finished? So, any questions so far? All right. I'm going to assume that all is clear as mud. We'll move on. Uh, Ken, quick question. Why would that be actually empty? Oh, because it doesn't have a place to look it up. Because it's it's in the GUI. Um, so if I go back to the GUI. It's a drop down. So it's going to list all of the possible um, databases. But since it's looking it up from sys.databases and that's not there, it can't. Ah, it. got it. Now, if it were offline or if it were re restoring or whatever else, so it's actually there, then it'll actually show you that it's there. It'll give you the name. So but basically, in this case, if you move a login from a different server with a default database on, so let's say you're moving login from server B to server A and the default uh, database for that It'll login fail. only exists on server B, It the, that fail. list would be blank. It, no, actually it'll fail because it, 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 it'll it say that database doesn't exist. You can't do that. What happened here is that I temporarily created a database called wrongdb. What's more likely to happen is, is that um, their default database is an old application or something and they'd forgotten all about it or whatever and that database is now removed. Ah, okay. And now Makes their sense. default database doesn't have a place to go. So that's basically like not exactly orphan login, but yeah, it's kind of the opposite. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So they they still have a database on a server that doesn't or they have a default database on a server that doesn't have that database anymore. But like I said, if I were to create that database and put it as offline, you'd get the same kind of result. It, you just have different things to do to fix it. And and it'll actually show up there. Uh, question for you. I'm guessing you're probably getting it with ASCII, but how do you get those uh, uh, creative characters? <laughs> um, so uh, in this particular case, um, I, I actually do this because I find for two major reasons. Um, but if you do, what is it, window period? All right, see how it's it's got the emoji oh, keyboard emoji. here? So they're just emojis. Got it. Okay, and, and I do that because um, A, people always ask, and because it's unusual, they remember. Um, and two, because they are Unicode characters that are really, really, really obvious. Um, and so if you're worried about writing code that deals with Unicode or that might potentially deal with Unicode characters, at, at least in my test databases, um, like I, I spent a good chunk of Saturday fixing some code because when I tried to run it um, for pra during my practice, I ran into a slight problem where I was just getting question marks because it, it wasn't dealing with the Unicode correctly. So, okay, so here's, and I'll, I'll show you how that, what, what actually happened in just a sec. So, um, there, these store procedures, SPSRV permissions and SPDB permissions, um, like I said, I wrote them to be research tools, 
I don't know if how often y'all have spent dealing with permissions, but just as a for example, I'm going to open up this user or this login. I mean, um, I can see their server roles here. Um, I can see their user. You know what? Believe it or not, this check box here is the the user has connect permissions to that database. That does not necessarily mean they've got a user there or not. So I could create a user for my SQL ID and put it somewhere here. It won't necessarily have a checkbox. If I don't, if, you know, if I remove the uh, the other permissions, and it'll only give you the role memberships. It won't give you any individual permissions that you've granted within those within that database. Um, you know, there are permissions that you can only see by going here and going to the database properties. Um, and you go down to permissions, and now you can see the database level permissions for any given person. Like I said, it's the information is all there. It's just not laid out in a single place in an easy way to get to. So I wrote these, and they're basically the same. Just one works at an instance level, and one works at a database level. So you can see here there are three outputs. The first one is a list of all principles. So logins and users and role or logins and roles, I mean, at the instance level. Um, it tells you the name, what type of login it is. So a SQL login, Windows login, Windows group, certificate map login, that kind of thing. That default database, default language, check policy, check expiration, that kind of thing, SID. Um, and this was not originally intended, but it happened um, a script on how to drop the database and a script to create, or not database, a script to create the login and a script to drop the login. I'll show you what those look like real quick. Let's not put that way. Okay, so to drop it and to add it back again. So it's easier to see. Okay, so if it exists, drop it. If it doesn't exist, we can create it. Um, notice that it has the password hash, so you don't actually have to know the password. It also has the SID, because this is a SQL Server login. <clears throat> Default database, language, all this stuff. So it will actually create it with all the information you need. Um, and we'll do more about that in just a sec. So the next output is role membership. So this login is a member of this role. Um, now it could be, in some cases, you could have, this could be a role name that is an, also a member of a role, uh, but then you also have the drop script and the add script. Um, I use SP add SRV per role member and SP add DB role member uh, primarily for backwards compatibility because they still exist. At some point, I will switch them over to the alter um, or to the, the create login and drop or sorry, alter role add and drop member commands. Um, but for now, these still work everywhere. So I've just left them that way. Um, and then down here is individual permissions. Zoom in here a little bit so you can see a little better what's going on. Um, ah, okay. So you've got um, the name, the login name, who granted the permission, at what level did they grant it, what's the permission name, is it a grant or not, and then the revoke script and the grant script. Now, like I said, this is a research tool. So I'm going to go ahead and run this with the, the parameter Ken. First parameter is the login name. It is a like. So I'm going to get just those um, principles with the word Ken in them. Now, this is a case sensitive instance. So that capital K is going to bring back everything with the domain Kenneth laptop. I could switch that to a lowercase K because as it happens, 
I only want one particular ID. And now I just get that one ID. Um, I'm not perfect. I don't think of everything. Sometimes you're going to want parameters that I don't have. I have a lot of parameters in here, but let's say it's something that you don't, that you need that I didn't think of. So you can print the queries that it creates. And you could put your own where clauses and then run it and you get the same output. Okay. Ken? Yeah. Quick question. Does it uh, does your script shows the who is the owner of the database? Um let's get to SPD permissions and we'll see. Okay. So that's actually the next command I'm gonna run is uh, SPDB permissions on Stack Overflow. So the first parameter for SRV permissions is the name of the user or the login, I mean. Um, the first parameter for DB permissions is the database name and the second is the username. So this is gonna give me all permissions for Stack Overflow 2013. Now it does not exactly show you but see how DBO is, the, there's no SRV principle. That's actually, DBO is the, the owner of the database, although it doesn't always 100% match up with what's in Sysdot databases, um, which I don't actually show. Because I couldn't think of a good way to put it into this output. But like I said, you'll see it's exactly the same output with the difference of it's at the database level instead of the instance level. Uh, um, I basically need to clarify something that, again, I thought I knew and I don't. Then you create, the new basic grant and ownership of a database. Does that actually create a user in the database with DBO or not? Um, all databases have a user called DBO. That no, should let's be say, to, let's that say it's SA. And then, then if you go in, Let's just go over here real quick. So if I go to Stack Overflow 2013. Uh, okay, so in Sysdot database principles, our name equals DBO. It has an SID, which, as it happens, I guess doesn't exist. It should, but it doesn't. Um, I can also go here, and this should be the owner of the, the database. Case sensitive. So, yeah, so they should be the same. They aren't necessarily, but they should be. Um, if they aren't, it's it's a bug in somewhere that I've never been able to reproduce. Yeah, see, they're not quite the same, but believe it or not, they are supposed to be the same. Hmm. The, the owner, the, the SID for DBO should be the owner of, stat, you know, also the owner. And if you were to go ahead and use... Best user's name? to SA, that should change them both to 0x01, which is SA. Huh. So if so, if you grant, so if you assign ownership of a database to SA, it's actually not creating a user of SA. No. OK. The, okay. the owner of the database is DBO, always and forever. Um, there is only ever one owner of the database, and that is DBO. And it is slightly different from the role DB owner, um, with the major difference being that you can't deny anything to DBO. So the actual database owner cannot be denied anything, whereas somebody who is a member of the DB owner role, you can be deny stuff. Got it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. So anyway, um, now one of the neat things about DB permissions is 
if you can change the database name to all, and that is going to do pretty much what y'all are going to expect. And it's going to run. That's going to take a second or two because I wasn't overly worried about performance when I wrote this code. Um, but you'll notice that all of the databases on my instance are going to be listed here, along with all the role memberships and all of the users. And you'll see why we're going to do, or all the individual permissions. You'll see why we might do that in a minute. Um, so I'm going to start with I want to. One of the uses for this is um, something I had to do recently. I want a list of all sysadmins on the instance so I can tell it the role is sysadmin. Top level here is role is sysadmin. And down here you see this is a list of all of the logins that have sysadmin. Um, I want to get a list of permissions I want to back up all the permissions from this, this database is actually lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, in case anybody was interesting, interested. Um, it's my Wizard of Oz database, so you'll see a lot of stuff like the cowardly lion, flying monkeys, that kind of thing. So this is all the permissions, and I could go over here and copy out all the create scripts and all the drop scripts. Um, notice how I just passed in the database name. If you want to, you can use the database. And then you can run just SPDB permissions. If the first parameter is null, then it's the current database. Um, now, I don't necessarily care about this stuff because I'm backing up my permissions here. So these are the, the ones that were included with Microsoft or by Microsoft. So I'm going to exclude those by default. Include MS shipped is one, but I can set it to zero. And now I only get the user defined stuff. Which is better, but not exactly what I want. So now I can go here and there's an output parameter. Where I can tell it I only want to see the scripts. And now I get the drop and create scripts. So this is all the scripts that you need to remove permissions and all the scripts you need to add them back again. I can also specify just the create scripts or just the drop scripts. Now, what I will do frequently if someone says, hey, um, I want to back up my permissions for this database, I'll run this create only script because I don't know about y'all, but I. I don't care about a spreadsheet that gives me all the information as much as I do a script to reapply the stuff if I need to. Um, so that's what, what I've got here. The other useful thing here is, let's say you are copying a database, um, which, well, we'll get to that in just a sec. Um, I could run this again for a different database and again, Get the scripts for, these are all the scripts for Stack Overflow 2013. Um, now let's say, well, let's go back up here real quick. Okay, so one of the other purposes for this is gonna be, let's say I'm copying a database from test to dev, but I wanna maintain my permissions from dev. What I'll do is I'll get the create script for dev, save this off, so copy all this in into a file somewhere. Do my restore. Then run the drop script, remove all the permissions. And then I can run my create script to put all the permissions back again. So now I've, I've maintained my dev script or my dev permissions. Into the, the database that I put there, wherever it came from. Let's say that somebody wants a list of all the permissions, but it's not a DBA, and they don't want to be able to restore permissions somewhere. They just want to be able to look at it cleanly. Let's say it's an auditor or a manager or something like that. There is an output called report. And in this particular case, I am going to get the database name, 
database principle, server level principle, if there is one, what type of login it is, and then a comma delimited list of roles and a comma delimited list of direct permissions. Which can be really handy. Um, again, a little cleaner if we go ahead and remove the, the MS ship stuff. And that's the user defined permissions. And that is something that we can easily copy into a spreadsheet and hand off to a manager or an auditor or whatever. And this will give them everything there is to see. And I, I remove the other stuff a lot of times because having dealt with enough auditors who said, what is this DB data reader role? I don't want that there. You need to remove it. And then I have to go back and explain to them that DB data reader cannot be removed and can't be edited and it just comes from Microsoft. And then I have to document it for them and I have to do that for all of these. And so I just stopped handing it to them because they don't mind if it's not there. Just if they see it, they get upset. Um, SRV permissions, same report. Like I said, these are very, very similar store procedures. Just one's instance level and one isn't. Um, if I want to copy all the logins from one instance to another, then I could do this and get a list, a create script. And this will, so let, let's say that you've got um, an old instance and you're updating it to a new instance. Then you could run this and you could copy this whole thing over. Um, and this will give you all of the instance level permissions. You do want to be kind of careful though, because it will also give the sysadmins. We'll copy over any sysadmins. So you kind of got to be careful there. Um, I will usually go ahead and, and put this into a file and then I'll review the file and make sure that all the permissions in there are ones that I want to put onto my new server. Um, but that's if you're copying the entire server. Uh, well, actually, uh, notice over here, there's a lot of these, these are certificates, the ones with the double pounds. And I don't want to copy those. So if you've ever done pattern matching much, the, the two brackets here, basically what that means is that any, the value of type, which is a single character as it happens, can be any character in here. So a lot of times I'll put GUS, which is groups, users, and SQL IDs. In this case, I'm putting the caret means not. So not Cs, which are certificates. I could put whatever else here and it would be not any of these. But in this case, I just want not certificates. And now I get, I've still got these two, which are SQL logins which I could exclude as well, that I'm not going to, because um, I can just as easily remove them manually. And here's that information. And I, I tend to build these things up a little bit at times because I want to be able to see what's going on. And then I'll come back and do the create script using that same parameter. And now I don't have all those certificates being created or logins for certificates, because they may be different. Now, along those lines, let's say I'm not copying the entire server, I'm just copying a given database. But one of the things you have to do so you don't get orphans is copy all of the logins related to that database. So there's a DB name parameter. And now I can run this, and this is just going to give me the login information associated with that database. So let's go ahead and run this without the create only so you can actually see all the information a little better. So all of these have an, a user within the lions and tigers and bears on my database, um, but only these. So you're not copying anything extra. All right. So now let's say someone comes to me and says, I've got an old service account. I'm getting rid of it. I want to put a new service account in. I want you to copy all the permissions from Scarecrow to the Tin Woodsman. All right, 
So I can go ahead and create this script on Lions and Tigers and Bears on mine for the Scarecrow. You can only get the create script here. Go over here. Now I go ahead and grab Tin Woodsman. And we go ahead and do a replace anywhere we see Scarecrow with Tin Woodsman. And I did this about 10 times and decided that's for the birds, for the crows. Um, and I added a parameter called copy to. Okay, copy to. Now when I run it, same exact script. Instead of anywhere it says Scarecrow, it now sent Tin Woodsman. Okay. Now, uh, I promised I'd show you what happened if you don't. If you mess up with Unicode with these emojis so that you can see it. And that N tells you that this is an this is a Unicode string. So if you don't have the N there, it doesn't pass it in as a Unicode and you get strings like this. Which is nice and obvious and a real pain in the neck to fix. Um, but at least if you have to deal with Unicode characters, it's very obvious that you've messed up something. Yeah, to be fair, just to warn you, um, the copy to option currently only works SQL ID to SQL ID and ADID to ADID. Uh, Active Directory ID to Active Directory ID. It's it's literally just a string copy. So any whatever string you put here will end up in replace to replace this. So while I'm at it, while I'm copying this, I want to double check and see if Scarecrow's in any other databases. So I'm going to run DB permissions for all databases with the login name that matches Scarecrow because the login name and the username do not have to match. So this is actually going to go to the instance level, check for the name Scarecrow, and get the the SID, the um, security ID, and check all the databases on your instance to make sure what permissions that guy has anywhere else. And in this case, he is in this database and the emoji database. And here are the permissions he has there. So now we can go back to the user and say, okay, I know you're doing the service account swap. Um, do you need these copied in the emoji database as well, or just in the lions and tigers and bears on my database? And again, just to show you how all these parameters can be layered on top of each other. We can do it this way and see how we passed in all. So we got all the, the script for all the databases that have Scarecrow in it. Now, I just want to show you one thing here real quick. Because I specified all databases, every single line on these scripts has a use at the beginning of it. So this particular um, scarecrow, it's going to use lions and tigers and bears on my first, use emoji. Then we go back to lions and tigers and bears on my to drop them from flying monkey, then back to emoji to drop them from flying monkey, and so on. OK? Because this is the remove script. So, so just be aware that if, if you're doing it for a single database, it doesn't have to use because I assume that you're going to be applying that to the database you specifically want. If you do it to all databases, then I'm assuming that you you want the same permission applied to the same you know, to the correct database. Can? Yeah. Uh, so obviously, it, then your on drop or create it doesn't log anything, right? Correct. I mean, it probably logs in the SQL Server, but it's it doesn't have any 
it doesn't store anything like in uh, Ola's Ellinger command log, for instance. Um, actually, if you're quick about it, uh, I have a script somewhere. I don't have it in this with this presentation, but um, I believe it's on my GitHub that will look in the um, oh, what's it called? The default trace. Mm, got it. And and okay. it does actually save that information to the default trace. But because the default trace is circular, it doesn't necessarily stay there very long. Got it. OK. Um, orphans. I've uh, got a quick setup script. All right, so added this, this uh, parameter just this weekend. Um, there's an option for showing orphans. Work if you pass in a, a specific database or all databases or whatever. Um, so these two are orphans. Notice this is uh, AD ID and this is a SQL ID. And if we go over to the right, as well as the drop script and the create script, there is a create login script and an alter user script because those are the two methods to fix an orphan. Okay, so if, for example, Sleepy already exists, so, you know, the AD version of Sleepy, if a login already exists with that name, then we can do an alter user to add it to correct the SID and match it back up. The SQL ID version. Um, if not, it already exists. And so if it does, it won't do anything because you don't want to mess yourself up that way. Um, then we've got to create script here to create the login. Now, um, I do want to point out, usually my create login scripts have a password, but we don't know what the password's going to be. So I put with password, insert strong password here. Um, I do put the correct SID to match the user. But in case you're interested, the reason for the GUID here, and anytime I, I have to specify that you need to put in a password, I always put a GUID at the end of it. After the, I think, third or fourth time that I applied this a script like this, and somebody's password was now insert strong password here, So just in case, I want to make sure that, you know, it actually is a strong password. So I throw a good at the end of it. That's a good one. <laughs> you you would actually be surprised. So the there are versions of, of DB permissions um, for uh, like Azure SQL DB where I don't have access, access to the password hash. So I have to specify any time it runs, insert strong password here. Well, like I said, the first time I wrote it, several times in a row, I managed to apply that as the person's password. So anyway, all right. So let's clean that up real quick. Yeah. Not really sure why that's happening, but we'll go with it. All right. Close a couple of scripts here. All right, so login token and user token. Um, these are really nice because they will show you all of the active, now for whatever reason they show them twice, but they show all the active directory groups that you belong to, um, including any roles that you belong to. So that's the login token. Now, for whatever reason, my user token one is not working the way I expect it to, especially since I'm a sysadmin. So it's only showing the fact that I'm um, sysadmin or DBO in this case. Um, so the nice thing though is that, I go 
login token. All right, you see this principal ID here? That maps to sys.server principles and sys.database principles. So for example, um, there's a group called Kenneth Laptop Help Library Updaters, which is not in this server in this instance. Uh, home users is not in this instance. Administrators is not in this instance. Even though I'm members of them, they have nothing to do with with this SQL Server instance. So I can go ahead and easily exclude that by saying principal ID is not zero. And now I only have the information appropriate to this instance. Again, this is a terribly in interesting because I'm sysadmin and there's not a whole lot going on there. So this is where we start getting into using impersonation. Okay, so I can't, so I'm gonna try and impersonate minor, but minor is an AD group. So it's not something you can impersonate. Okay, you can only impersonate SQL IDs and AD, group, AD users. So I'm gonna go ahead and impersonate Dopey. Now, anything I run is gonna run as if it's Dopey. So I can go ahead and run sys.login token. And now I see the role that Dopey belongs to. So Dopey is a dwarf, Dopey is a miner, and Dopey is a gamer. He's also, well, I'm not sure what none and home users are, but you know, hey. Um, and again, I can go in and exclude out anything that doesn't have an entry for this instance. Now I know and understand that this is just my test server. Um, this is obviously not any kind of production server. I had um, at my old company, we had thousands upon thousands of AD groups across the company. And if you'd been there a while, you might be a member of a couple hundred of them, if not more. So this became really, really important because I only care about the ones where they are using these entries to hit this server. Or in the case of users, or user token, no. see user token, because I'm in master, I, there's nothing there because I don't have permissions in master. But if I go to Stack Overflow 2013, and now I go to sys.user token, you'll see I'm a member of DB, or Dopey is a member of DB Data Reader and Writer, and he's a member of Dwarf and Miner, and these groups are used in this database. So if someone needs to know how is um, Dopey getting permissions to this database, this is how, those two AD groups. And again, I can say ID is greater than zero. Again, you know, potentially this could have a hundred different entries. So being able to exclude it down to just the stuff that is a, you know, appropriate to this database can be really handy. Um, now, I need to revert to get back to me, which I can't do because I changed databases. So if you change databases and try to revert back to your own ID after you've impersonated something, you're going to get an error and you're not going to be told where you have to go back to. If you can't remember, and there have been occasions where I couldn't, you have to re-log in. And I mean, not to your machine, but just close the query and go back in it or, you know, go to connection, change connection, and then reconnect. And that'll get you back to your default, back to you and, and not impersonate anything. Otherwise, if you do remember, you can go back to that database and then revert and you're back to you. Okay. Now, um, we've got um, Slick and Snick, or Blick and Snick, which are new hires, and they need the same permission as Grumpy in Stack Overflow 2013. Okay. Anybody curious about who Slick and, and Snick and Blick are, you can look them up. I found them very interesting people. Um, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at Grumpy, Grumpy's permissions. Again, null means current database. And he does actually have an entry. Because if he didn't have an entry, nothing would have shown up. And he is directly added to the DB, uh, DBDDL admin group. 
which means that our uh, our new users are going to have to be added to that group as well. Um, now, if we impersonate Grumpy, and we check out user token, we will see that he is, again, a member of Miner and a member of Dwarf. And he does, this also shows that, see, he's got a principal ID for Grumpy. And again, we're going to go ahead and run this because this will exclude out anything that we don't care about, in this case, public. And again, just a good habit to get into because you could have hundreds of entries there. Okay, so now I'm going to, so I know that I've got to tell the user um, or the manager, whoever asked, that they need to add Grumpy to, my, or not Grumpy, Blick and, Blick and Snick to Miner and Dwarf. Um, and then put in a request to get them added to the DDL admin role. And just because I like to be careful, I'm going to go ahead and check the permissions. Oops, I forgot to revert. The permissions from Miner. And the, notice that Miner is DB data reader. And the permissions for Dwarf, which is data reader and data writer. And because I'm also very careful. And when I tell people to add, be added to a group, I'm always, you always have to be aware and make them aware that being added to an AD group doesn't just grant you permissions in that database. It's gonna give you permissions in every database that that AD group is in. Um, obviously you can't necessarily check all the instances and you can't check permissions outside of SQL, but you know, let's at least check within this instance and make sure that when they're added to minor we've got some idea what's going on minor didn't show anything <clears throat> other than stack overflow 2013 and neither did dwarf all right so how about flick flick is being added and they're actually going to be joining the same team as sneezy and sleepy but the manager doesn't know what AD groups Sneezy and Sleepy are in for this particular team. Um, Sneezy's been there 20 years. He's been in a lot of teams. He's been in a lot of groups. Same with Sleepy. They aren't necessarily the same groups. They've got a left, lot of leftover permissions. We need to find what AD groups they are both in. So the easy way to do that is to execute as Sneezy, load his information from sys.user token into a temp table and then revert so that we can go back to our information. Then we'll do the same thing with Sleepy. Okay. And you can use an intersect between the two temp tables. So I loaded them into a temp table, one each for their names. And we intersect and we see that they are both in the dwarf role or dwarf group. Obviously, Sneezy is not in the dwarf group, or sorry, in the minor group where Sleepy is. That's because Sneezy has allergies and he's not actually allowed in the mines. You know, we're all laughing on mute. <laughs> That's cute. Thank you. It's, it's hard to do these over, you know, when you're not in person because you can't really get a feedback, but I do try and throw the odd joke in there and the odd amusing thing. So. I appreciate it. Um, so XP login information, like I said, it's not, I, I run into problems with it. Be, they've always been permissions based, you know, where I didn't have permissions to run it for that particular group, but when it works, it's really useful. So I can run that. And so I'm passing in the username or the, the AD name and the keyword members. And now I've got a list of all the people that are in that group. Snow White is a honorary dwarf. Um, that will let you do this, which is let's say I wanna know um, everybody who's in both dwarf and minor on great temp tables and run XP login information into those tables. 
I can do an intersect to see who's in both. Hey, Ken. Yeah. Out of curiosity, when you're doing the XP login information, is that querying Active Directory directly? Yes. Or is okay. I got it. Thank you. It is, to my knowledge, it is is querying Active Directory directly. And there is a parameter, I don't know it off the top of my head, that will let you look at all of the groups that a given user is a member of. Thank you. Um, I prefer, like I said, I prefer login token because I find that, that login token and user token always work, but XP login info doesn't always. Again, because of just because of permissions. Um, okay. Whereas login token and user token, the information has to make it to SQL Server, so it's now exposed. Whereas querying directly off of AD is not always going to work. Um, except will tell me any member of Dwarf that isn't in Miner, when in this case it's Sneezy and Snow White. Because again, Sneezy has allergies and Snow White is, while an honorary Dwarf doesn't know how to mine. Okay, FNMI will tell you what permissions you have for a given object. Okay, so lions and tigers and bears am I. Um, so what permissions do I have for the Emerald Palace? And because I'm sysadmin, I have all permissions. And in case you're interested, Emerald Palace only has one column, which is address. Um, so what permissions do I have for the database itself? Again, I have all of them. Which is less than useful as a sysadmin. However, if you know a user that you want to check, you can impersonate that user, in this case, the Scarecrow. And what permissions does the Scarecrow have for FN my permission or for Emerald Palace? They have a fair number, but not all of them. So they can select, they can update, insert, and delete, and they can alter the table as well. Um, how about the database? So at the database level, that's how they have all these permissions, because you'll notice they have insert, update, select, and delete here too. They also have execute, connect, and view any column encryption and master key definitions. All right, so let's go back. Now that I know that, um, and, and the reason I'll do that is because if I'm granting someone permissions and I'm running into problems, um, I've had occasions where I've tried to grant this person permissions two, three, four times, and it's not working. And after having asked them to check and see if it works the first time, and sometimes the second time, I'm done asking, and I'm going to make sure it's working before I talk to them again, or, or at least before I have them try again. So at that point, I'll start checking to make sure, do they in fact have the permissions, or um, just to be clear, this is a consolidated permission. So if they have a deny somewhere, you won't see this permission, even though you know you granted it somewhere. This doesn't tell you where it's coming from. It just tells you these are their effective permissions. Um, and so now we can go and take a look at Scarecrow. And you'll notice Scarecrow has executed at the database level and select on tables, which or sorry, and houses, which is an object, or which is a table. Um, but he's also a member of the Flying Monkeys. So let's take a look at what permissions the Flying Monkeys have. And he's a member of DB Data Reader and Writer, along with having Alter on the Emerald Palace and select directly on the Emerald Palace. Now, obviously, having select on the Emerald Palace and having data reader is kind of redundant, but that kind of thing happens sometimes. And be aware, I'm, I'm going through a lot of this stuff and showing you, you know, okay, I've looked here, so now I'm going to go and actually look at their permissions just to get you an idea of the flow that I go through because I, I want to see just in general what's going on before I go back to the user to say, this is what's happening. I, I don't want to just say, oh yeah, no, you, you, you don't have permissions. Well, why don't you have permissions? Where should the permissions be? That kind of thing. And this will in fact tell you um, over here if they're denied something, or they could be a member of deny data reader or deny data writer or something. 
So. Ken? Danny is asking yeah. about the procedures. So probably, the, the, well, not probably. The F and my permissions, it's a function, but it's a built-in function. But Correct. he's probably asking about the two procedures that you are showing, the, the okay. server and the database. These two right here? Yeah. Yes. Open up a... Was there a link to those somewhere? Yeah, you probably presented this earlier in the presentation. No, actually, I I, um, I just mentioned that they are on SQLstudies.com. Okay. Um, and and they'll they're in my GitHub as well, and they will be in the directory for this um, for this presentation. But if you go to my uh, go to my blog, they're right here. And there's SRV permissions, DB permissions. Uh, AZ SQL DB permissions and AZ Synapse DB permissions. Perfect. Thank you so much, sir. Mm -hmm. And like I said, they're they're in GitHub as well. Um, and if you go, actually, if you, oops, I don't know to do. So if you yeah. go to one of them um, and you actually look at the script, I do have links within the script to the GitHub. Okay. So, it says cool. edit for some reason. Um, yeah, the query is a big, big one. Is we're having to do Excel, um, our CSV exports from Active Directory with PowerShell to get data into our system to, to check for members. So, I'd like to automate that, not use that, instead do this. So Let me, let me show you one more thing. If you're trying to automate with this thing. Your agenda. Uh, but. Yeah, if you're trying to automate with it, um, Again, don't let me distract you from your your your. Oh course. no, that's fine. Um, okay. Oh, because case sensitive server and typing in a demo. Um, I actually do it, it. It's I left time for questions, so I just want okay, to show you something. There is a, a parameter here called drop temp tables, mm -hmm. which by default is one, but if you set it to zero, then it will not drop the global temp tables that I create to store the information in. Fabulous. Um, and if you go and take a look, um, this is in, in the store procedure. Our, mm -hmm. all, it's all the documentation. And if you come down here to drop temp tables, these are the three global temp tables that it stores the information in. Beautifully documented. Thank you, Ken. Uh -huh. And of course, if you have any problems or questions with this, I mean, catch me on Twitter, put a comment in the blog, send me an email. Again, not great at emails, but I do try. Um, Understood. Thank you. <laughs> uh -huh, of course. OK, so um, we had a termination script. Um, if someone was let go, then the termination script would run the next day. In fact, it ran every day and checked. Um, and it would delete all the logins, and then it would try and delete the users, and sometimes it failed. So let's do a quick setup. We just did an audit of local named uh, accounts on servers. I'm so glad you're going over this. We found a ton of named accounts with uh, for users that were no longer with the company. This well, is interesting. And and they're they're I mean e this is not really how to find them all and get rid of them all, but this will t show you why they might still be there. Okay. So if I go to drop Dopey, I, I can't because he owns a schema. All right. So let's take a quick look at Dopey, and there's no information in here about what schemas he owns. So sorry. Uh, but this little script right here will tell you what schema is he owns. And in this case, he owns the Dopey schema. You can also go to the Object Explorer and Security. And let's hit refresh. The Dopey shows up. Uh, there he is, Dopey. And these are the schemas he owns. And of course, you could check this off here. Um, but that just removes him as the owner. Uh, if you look up something called ownership chaining, which I'm not going to explain because it is a really high level 
or very high end version of how permissions work. Um, but not having an owner for a schema will change how the permissions work on it. What owner who owns it will change um, how the permissions work for it. Nine times out of 10, you can probably drop the schema or drop anything that's in the schema and then drop the schema. And then you don't have a problem. Um, of those remaining, that remaining one time, most of the time, you can just set the owner, which is what the script will do, to DBO. Um, worst case, if you're being very careful about your security, you could create a SQL ID or a user without a login um, and make that the owner of the, the schema. Um, so but let's go ahead and, and take it off Adobe. And now we can try again. And this time we got a new error. Um, I, I have seen a lot of errors with this and, and where the user owns different objects. So I'm not going through all those, just the one. This one's kind of unusual though. And in this case, the database principal has granted or denied permissions to objects in the database. So let me show you what that means. So let's just go ahead and look at DB permissions. Come down here. And you see how this grant her name? This is who granted the permission. So Dopey actually granted the Tin Woodsman select permissions on DBO. All right, so we can't drop Dopey while this is here. Um, so what we have to do is revoke that permission. Now, when I revoke this permission, you could, I could actually grant this guy permission. In fact, let's do that real quick. I always make a point of granting the person the permission back because just because it was Dopey that added them and or granted it to them and Dopey isn't in the company anymore, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Tinsman, Tin Woodsman doesn't need, still need that permission. So we're gonna go ahead and grant him that permission. And now, interestingly enough, if we come down here, we will see that the Tin Woodsman has been granted the permission, same permission. Okay, he's been granted select on the schema DBO by both the database owner, which is me, um, and Dopey. So it can actually be both. So that's why when I specify I'm revoking the permission, I always make sure that I revoke it as the person that I want to remove. Okay, because if I just did a revoke, if I just do this, that's actually going to remove the DBO version and not the Dopey version. Remove that. And now we can go ahead and drop him. We'll clean up. All right. This is, <clears throat> I, I thought this was so cool. Okay. Um, I would get users, uh, developers that would come to me and say, hey, I am getting an error. Um, let's go ahead and log in as the Tin Woodsman so you can see this error. Okay, I am getting an error that the select permission was denied on the object forest paths on the database lions and tigers and bears on mine. And they'll send me this error. And this error is all but useless because they don't necessarily know what service account was running. They're just getting this error in their application and they this application, you know, like I said, we had a lot of churn um, the fact that there was a developer calling me at all was sometimes a miracle. Uh, you know, he might have only been working on this thing for a couple of weeks, and this is a 20 year old application. And, you know, over the last year, there have been 12 different or 10 different developers assigned to this thing. So, no information has been passed along. <clears throat> so, um, I found this neat little script, and, and again, this is not my script. 
Um, so I always put in attribution. Um, this is the script itself, and then here's some extra additional information. This creates an extended event. Um, you got to be careful about where you're storing the information, um, and you might have to put it in the ring buffer, depending on what you're doing. Like if you're doing a managed instance, you got to put it in the ring buffer. You can't just put it in that path. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. And then I can go over here and let's see. Can't remember where this is. Oh, not at the database level. It's at this server level and failed queries. And I'm going to go ahead and watch live data. And nothing's going on yet, but I'm going to go ahead and run this again. And I get that error again. So I have them go into the application, reproduce the error. And lo and behold, I have an error. And not only do I have the error, but I have the database, the text they ran that gave them the error, and the user. So now they're going, oh, I don't know what service account is running this, or I'm sure it's this service account. I'm like, well, that service account has the permissions you're looking for. So I'll run this uh, extended, extended event session, go in, I'll turn this on, and have them try it again. And now I know exactly what user was getting that error. And if you're really on the ball and, and you're not fighting fires 20 times a day, um, you could actually just run this and pull the information uh, the script that I've got here does have a query here to pull the basics. Um, I need to add username in here at some point, but and it'll give you the information, um, the historical information about what's going on. And you can periodically check it out and see what errors have been occurring on your instance and get them fixed. I don't know if you all find that as cool as I do, but I think it's pretty cool. Um, and clean up, we're going to stop it and drop it. And I believe that's it. Okay. Any other questions? No, sir. All right. So far, so good. All right, I'm done. Um, thanks for showing up. It's a very good presentation, but I, I have the urge to go and build an arc. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Uh, nope. Uh, let's see. Boat. Oops. Ah. So All right, here you go. Uh, and we'll use that as the arc. There you go. You have an arc. <laughs> hey, Ken. So it sounds like your experience has been a lot uh, with auditors, which is something we've also been dealing with, too, and trying to uh, share permissions and look at where roles, um, what, what permissions roles are granting to databases um, and what database permissions. So this was really helpful. And, and being able to do that deep dive. Um, we've been apprehensive in trying to look at at the individual database permissions and, and even at the, at the cell level, um, uh, you know, as to what people can modify, because obviously auditors want to know modify access. We need to know privileged access. And so- And here's the thing, I mean, um, work. So here's the thing. Um, a lot of times, mm -hmm. auditors will accept this. Even though, um, you know, let's change it to Scarecrow or to the this other one because it's got slightly better information. Okay. Um, 
because I've got an I've got a user defined role. Um, oops. Mm -hmm. Remember, I told you you gotta gotta have that N for Unicode. Um, so, a lot of times they will take this. So you could throw this into a into an Excel spreadsheet, mm -hmm. and they'll take it even though you know, like Scarecrow is a member of Flying Monkey. And they'll be okay with that because they can then look here and say Flying Monkey is a member of DB Data Reader and Data Writer. I see that one more time. Flying Monkey is a member of SQL User, Scare, and then Flying Monkey has Data Reader, Data Writer. Oh, I see. Okay. It's when you got roles that are nested, same with AD groups, when you got people that are in, you know, AD groups that are groups of groups. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, and again, I've never had an auditor that wouldn't accept this as good enough. Um, they don't necessarily care about, <clears throat> like, you know, for, for a, a group, for an AD group, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily care to see all the, you know, in this display. Yeah. They don't necessarily have to see Bob has exactly these permissions. Joe has exactly these permissions. Yeah, we if have you just show already ever. Yeah, well, if you just show this AD group has these permissions, and then on another page you show this AD group has these members. God, okay. a lot of times that'll be good enough. Well, what what has been helpful in this meeting um, is answering which of the custom roles we're we're dealing with a lot of custom roles that that like you said developers have created, and then no information was passed on as to what permissions they were given. To the databases so we have to go and figure out is it a modify a modify role or not does it grant any of that um you know the ability to change data inside of a database so um very helpful today and what i've seen so far i'm going to try and test some of this and, and uh i believe what you showed us a few minutes ago that was really cool does that very thing like if i do that yeah now you're only seeing user defined stuff <clears throat> and again, now here's the downside to doing it this way. Okay. Um, let's say you've got a, an AD group that is read access to these 50 tables. Mm -hmm. It's going to show you grant select on table name, or like right here, grant select on object DBO Emerald Palace. Grant right. select on object DBO. And, and so this, this direct permissions thing can get very, very long. Yes, it can. Yep. But again, because nine times out of ten, they don't need to be able to scan it and see everything. They want to pick a specific, you know, a, a, like ten specific things mm -hmm. and check them. And this lets them do that very easily. Got it. So now I will say I have had a problem where I have had to certify the uh, the code behind it. Um. <laughs> Where you know they want some wanted one of their auditors to actually read the code <clears throat> and and understand it and then certify that it was never going to change. Uh, at which point I said, "Well, go ahead and make a copy of it for yourself." That you know, so that it never gets updated. Yep. Um, I actually, you know, they they made me remove for for their copy a whole bunch of the documentation because I have some buyer beware comments in there, ah. which say, anytime you are running something that you got off the internet, you better make sure you understand what, what you're doing. Oh, granted, of course, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, they didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Got it. Again, thank you so much. Great presentation today. Of course. Uh, Ken, I'll take over uh, for the raffle. All right. Can I, can I ask you one quick question? Of course. Um, so this is regarding the patching. Is there any way we can find out? So let's say if Microsoft released some patch beginning of the year and we installed somewhere in like middle of the year, maybe July or something. Is there any way we can find out when exactly we installed the patch? This is also one of the audit finding related questions. Are you looking to automate that? Or are you looking just if you go to the control panel, it'll tell you when patches were installed. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was thinking to add something for the automated process. If you're <laughs> automating it, 
in PowerShell, get hotfixes mm -hmm. will tell you when it was installed and you could output that output to a table. It's probably the easiest way to do that. Get hotfixes, okay. It's, it's yeah. more of an operating system audit than, than a TC, a database audit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I was going to say the only way that I know to check is to actually go into the, the file system and uh -huh. look at the files and when they were written. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even 100% certain that would work, so. Sure, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining our online meeting today. With that, thank you. Have a great day and see you here in the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kenneth.